Today, we're going to look at another aspect of the first derivative game, and that's going to come in the category of optimization. Here, what we're looking for are points that were referred to as a local maximum or a local minimum. A local maximum is where a function is changing direction from increasing to decreasing. A local minimum will be a point where a function is changing from decreasing to increasing. So we're looking for a change for in direction. So we're looking for a point where the function is changing direction. So we want to find a local maximum or a local minimum. We are looking for a point where the function is changing direction. If it changes from increasing to decreasing, we'll say that's a local maximum. And if it's changing from decreasing to increasing, we'll say that that is a local minimum. So right away, we notice some things. I brought up the direction of the function. And so we know what tells us about the direction of the function is the sign of the derivative. So if we're looking for where the function is changing direction, we're looking for where the derivative is changing sign. So here we are just using the same information that we had before. We know that the sign of the derivative tells us about the direction of the function. If we're looking for a point where the function is changing direction, that means we are looking for a point where the derivative is changing sign. So our function for at a local maximum, our function is changing from increasing to decreasing. Our derivative changes from positive to negative. At a local minimum, our function is changing from decreasing to increasing. So our derivative is changing from negative to positive. We're looking for where the function is changing direction. So we're looking for where the derivative is changing sign from positive to negative or from negative to positive. Now I've referred to these points as a local maximum or a local minimum. The reason that we have the word local is that this might be the highest point in a neighborhood around that point, but it might not be the highest point on the graph. So if I take these two together, maybe this local maximum happens. And if we look at a neighborhood around that point, it is the highest point. But that does not mean it is the highest point every, everywhere on this function. Maybe this function has a local minimum. And then it keeps going up. So here's a local maximum. And here's a local minimum. But we see that this is this is the highest point near that point. But it's not the highest point everywhere on the graph.
So the local maximum is not the highest point on the graph. There are points on the function that are bigger than that point, that local maximum, but in a small neighborhood around that, uh, around that point, that is the highest point. It's the highest point in California. It's not the highest point in the United States. Similarly with local minimums. That local minimum is the lowest point in a neighborhood around that point, but it's not the lowest point on the entire function. There are points on the graph that have a lower value than that local minimum, but in that neighborhood around the local minimum, it is the lowest point. Question? So we're using optimize to look because we're trying to either maximize or minimize a function. So suppose that we want to maximize our profits or minimize our costs. So just generally, we're going to say optimize and then pick whichever one we happen to want at, a, at that given point. So this is to maximize. Or minimize. Those are the two things that we might want to do. So we just put that in one category called optimize. Any questions? Here's what we want to look for. Uh, so in optimization, I said find and classify critical points. Critical points are where the function might be changing direction. And we have our first clue as to what a critical point is here. We want to look for places where the derivative is changing sign. And so that means we want to look for places where the derivative is equal to zero. So critical points are points where the first derivative is equal to zero. Now you can tell by the tone of my voice that I'm gonna say something else after that. Otherwise I would have had wrap up the sentence voice. But I said critical points are gonna be where the first derivative is equal to zero or where the first derivative is undefined. This one gets skipped over a lot because we introduced this with polynomials because we're very familiar with polynomials. Polynomials being continuous everywhere with continuous derivatives means we don't find a lot of these undefined points. But we might have a local minimum at a point where the derivative is not equal to zero. For example, if we have an absolute value graph, Here we have a local minimum, but f prime is undefined. We would not see that if we took the derivative and said equal to zero and solve. So we're going to want to look for point plate points where the first derivative is undefined. So at this point. Historically, becoming proficient at this was a three on the AP calculus exam. You just took the AP calculus exam. Every function that was handed to you, if you take the derivative, set it equal to zero and solve, you got a three. That was it. Even if you knew nothing about integrals, you just like derivative equal to zero and solve it. And 
that would be enough to get a three. I think that's changed. We're actually starting to check work on the AP calculus exam, but that's beside the point. The important thing to get from this is that we get something to do. Take the first derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve. I want to find out uh, where a function changes direction. I want to find out where its first derivative changes sign. Oh, I had one, and I just and I I did not bring it with me. Here. This is what I want the derivative to be. So I'm going to make a function that'll have that as a derivative. Then I'll tack some stuff onto the end of it. Then maybe what I'll do is like, well, I don't want that one third making it obvious that I just integrated this function to get a derivative with two easy to find zeros. So then what I'll do is I'll just multiply by three. Then I'm like, oh, this is two, three heavy. There's too many threes going on. So I'll just change this last three. To a five. Now I've got a completely random looking function that will have really easy to find zeros. Really easy to find critical points. If I was editing these videos, that part would be edited out and just included in the making of. And then there would be like the director's commentary where they show the movie and it's just the director watching his own movie talking about all the different scenes. You know what I mean? Has anybody ever watched one of those? I don't know that anybody has ever watched one of those, like all the way through. Because if, I, I mean, even if it's the director of the movie, I don't think I want them talking the whole way through the movie. It's like, if you sit down and watch a movie with your friend and they just talk about the movie the whole time, don't you get annoyed? And yet people think they, they voluntarily subject themselves to that. Yeah, well, we got, let's, let's include like four extra DVDs in our DVD box set. Why sell the movie once when we could sell it a dozen times? I mean, Disney was certainly onto something there. You know what I mean? So that would be, this was definitely be like behind the scenes, the making of Calc 1. So here's our function. This is what the way it would look like to the audience. The audience just walks in and says, find the critical points of this function. x cubed plus 3x squared minus 9x plus 5. So we're looking for points where the first derivative is equal to 0 or the first derivative is undefined. So I need the derivative of this function. So f prime, i.e. We're going to solve the equation f prime of x equals 0. That's the question, find the critical points of this function. Solve f prime of x equals zero. So we'll take the derivative, f prime, which is gonna be three x squared plus six x minus nine plus zero. We're gonna set this equal to zero and solve the resulting equation. We can divide out a three now that we've got uh, an equation and I can say x squared plus two x minus three equals zero. At which point everybody would be like, oh, oh, it's factorable. 
Um, but yeah, I'll still be like, oh, that's weak. Even though I got here by writing down the factors that I wanted, we're pretending that we don't know. So we're solving a quadratic equation. And if I start picking quadratic equations at random, the probability that the polynomial part will be factorable is equal to zero. That's how rare factorable polynomials are. Like if you pick a number at random, like actually at random, pick a real number at random, the probability that it, you get a rational number is zero. That's how rare rational numbers are when compared to how frequent the real numbers are. Same kind of thing. It's just that you've got this really skewed view of polynomials. Most of the polynomials that you've encountered in your mathematical career have been factorable because one of the goals of algebra is to learn how to factor polynomials. So to, to that end, we hand you a bunch of factorable polynomials, not realizing the terrible bias we're giving you towards unfactorable polynomials. And then we just like, be like, oh, just use the quadratic formula. Don't worry about completing the square, even though there is no quadratic formula without completing the square. Maybe we should learn to complete the square because it's superior anyway. This is, fa this is factorable and we can easily see that. Forget the quadratic formula. It's got an even X coefficient. We should be completing the square. We think what will complete the square with an X squared plus two X? Well, I'll complete the square with a plus one. And to make sure I still have a minus three at the end, I'll have to subtract four. Now, sometimes this is you take the minus three, you put a plus one to complete the square, and then you put a minus one to balance it out. Just balance it out. If I have a plus one, what do I have to have to put a minus three? Minus four. So now I can, now I can clearly see my polynomial. There's the middle at negative one, plus or minus the square root of four, which is two. Negative one plus two is one, negative one minus two is negative three. These are the same two that we would get if we had factored it. But this is a math class and arriving at the answer is not actually the point of most of the work that you do in a math class. It's connecting the new material to the old material and looking for patterns to see how things work. Does that make sense? That's why it really bothers me when people just say, during a math, well, in a math class, there's always just one right answer. It's like, well, no, there's not always just one right answer. There may just be one right answer like this one and negative three. But there are a lot of ways to get there. And if you know one way to get to the answer, you don't know nothing. You don't know enough. You should know all the ways to arrive at the answer because you never know what's going to be useful in the future. Does that make sense? So when people are like, oh, well, there's always just one answer in a math class. That just tells me that they don't understand what they're talking about. And I wish they would just stop talking, at least about that. You know what I mean? My point is that the answer isn't the point. The stuff that leads up to the answer is the point. This is all beside the point. We got these two zeros of the first derivative. So here are our two critical points. So we'll say f has critical points at x equals 1 and negative 3. These are going to be the locations, or at least the x coordinates, of the places where the function is changing direction or possibly changing direction.
And we're going to want to know at each of these points, are we looking at a local maximum, a local minimum, or neither? We're going to want to calculus our way through this in multiple ways, even though we already know there's going to be a maximum at negative three and a minimum at one because of the shape of the function. We might not have noticed that going in. But if you've got two critical points and you got a function that looks like the way it does, it's pretty likely that we're going to have a maximum, a minimum, and then those are going to be our two classifications. Let's find out. So we can classify the critical point. What we're looking for is a place where the function is changing direction. We're looking for a place where the derivative is changing sign. So that's going to be our thought process. Is the derivative changing sign at these points? That's our question. Now, before we move on, we should note that critical points happen when the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. And since we're working with a polynomial, we know that, that this polynomial is gonna be defined everywhere. So there are no critical points because the derivative is undefined. We gloss over that so much, I forgot to even mention that here are our critical points and there are not any others. There's no secret critical points from the function being undefined. The function is defined everywhere. So we should make a note of that, note. No points. Where F prime is undefined. There are no points where F prime is undefined. F prime is a polynomial. Polynomials are defined everywhere. That's why we like them. So what I'm gonna do to determine if the function is changing sign at these points is I'm gonna make an X axis and I'm gonna put these points on it. Here's negative three, here's negative three, and here's one. At each of these points, F prime oops, is equal to zero. I spelled zero wrong. At these points, F prime is equal to zero. In between these points, notice that these two points define the X, define the, divide the X axis into three different regions. In each of those regions, F prime is doing one thing. It's either being positive or being negative. It can't be both because we've marked all the points where the, fun the F prime is changing sign. So F prime is either positive or negative in each of those three regions. F prime is only positive or only negative in these three regions. F prime can only be positive or negative in each of those regions. So all I need to do is pick a point to test each of those regions. So between negative three and one, I'm gonna choose zero because it's easy to plug in. F prime of zero is three times zero squared plus six times zero minus nine. Between negative three and one, F prime must be negative. If it's negative at zero, it's gotta be negative everywhere between negative three and one.
Now I'm going to pick a point from that left, negative, uh, less than negative three. So I'm going to pick F prime. I need All I need is something less than negative three. I want something easy to plug in. I'm going to pick 10, negative 10. This is because we've been trained to count in base 10. So we get 300 and negative 60, negative nine. 300 and negative 60 is 240 minus nine, 231. So negative 231. Oops, positive 231, because that's positive 300. The thing that we actually care about is that F prime is positive at negative 10. Now I need to check something from that third region, greater than one. Pick something greater than one that's easy to plug in. I choose 10, yes. We need to pick something greater than one. One would be easy to plug in, but I don't already know the derivative is going to be zero there. That's that way it needs something strictly greater than one. We could plug in two, but look at all the calculations we'd have to do. I mean, go big or go home, right? <laughs> you can't do that in class. I gotta I gotta watch that phrase in class. So I'm like, oh, go big or go home. You're like, oh, 1.1. Bye. I did not go big, so I'm gonna go home. Bye. Which is weird because it's like always an option. Y'all, y'all are adults. Like if in the middle of class, you just like want to leave, you just like gather your stuff and go. You know what I mean? It's not like high school where I'm going to be like, oh, where you need a hall pass. It's like, oh, no one's going to say boo you know? unless you're being like obnoxious about it. If you like slam your book shut and like zip really loud, zoop, and like go stomping out. My favorite is when someone wants to leave and they're on that side of the room. And instead of just using that door, they like walk right the heck in front of me. If you do that, by the way, I get to clothesline you. As soon as you like look at, if you're like walking in within arm's reach, I do get to stab you. <laughs> I mean, you've got that whole back, behind the back row, there's like space for someone to walk and there's two exits. If you like walk here when I'm talking, I get to smack you. That's just like the rules. I think it's in the student handbook. At least the student handbook that I posted and edited on Wikipedia. Just kidding. I'm not going to use physical violence against students. Emotional damage is much more longer lasting. So I'm going to plug in something bigger than one, and I like to plug in 10, because like I said, we've been trained to count in base 10. So we get 360 negative 9, or positive 351, which is greater than 0. So if f prime is positive when x is 10, X, F prime is going to be positive at every X bigger than one because it it's zero at one. If it's going to be negative somewhere past one, it's going to have to be zero at somewhere past one as well, or undefined. We're either going to have to see pass through zero or cheat, stop down below zero and then immediately go above zero, which would mean that the, sec the, the first derivative is discontinuous, which would have showed up in our first derivative. Since that didn't happen, what's happening after one is what's happening at 10, or the other way around. What's happening at 10 is what's happening after one. So I can see at negative three, the first derivative changes from positive to negative. So the function changes from increasing to decreasing.
And so that means F has a local max increasing or decreasing at x equals negative 3. At x equals 1, our derivative changes from negative to positive. So our function is changing from decreasing to increasing. So we'll have a local minimum at negative 1. Any questions? We did not have a lot of options as to what was going to happen because we have a, a cubic polynomial to work with. So the derivative is going to be some quadratic polynomial. So we don't have a lot of options as to what's going to happen. That's why I picked this one. Question. That is correct. At no other point could our derivative be equal to zero. So our function could not be changing direction because our derivative is second degree. So it has at most two, actually it has exactly two zeros. In this case, it's got two distinct real zeros, which means it's got two places and it must be turning around in each of those places. So that is correct. This is why we start off with a third degree polynomial. So I could have these two places where it turns around. One's a minimum, one's a max. Any questions? Polynomials make things a lot easier. Knowing what our function looks like, knowing that we have a cubic polynomial and finding these two critical points, that tells us what we're going to be dealing with. So here, we classified them using the first derivative. We could have classified them using the zero derivative, that is the function itself. That kind of only works because of the shape of the function. So, incidentally, the problem part is done. So we found the critical points, we classified them, we did all that with the first derivative, everything is cool. So a thing that we want to note if we start off with a cubic polynomial I'm not just describing its artistic style I should say it's a third degree polynomial that means its derivative is going to be a quadratic quadratic polynomial Our question is about the zeros of the first derivative. So as a quadratic polynomial, we have to have two zeros. A quadratic polynomial definitely has to have two zeros. Just like a cubic polynomial definitely has to have three zeros, but we're not concerned about the zeros of the cubic polynomial. We care about the zeros of the quadratic derivative. So the quadratic definitely has two zeros. Now they come in different varieties. It could be like we had in the previous example, distinct real zeros.
It could be that our quadratic has distinct real zeros. So there's some quadratic. And there are two zeros. Whether it's a happy parabola or a sad parabola, it's distinct real zeros. Other possibilities. It could be that our two zeros happen to be twins. This still counts as two. If you have a twin, your parents have two kids, not one kid. Same thing here. It could be that we have a repeated real zero. So what that means is that the vertex is on the x-axis. So we have a real zero with multiplicity two. x minus h squared, the square of the difference between x and h. Or we could have complex zeros. If we start with a quadratic with real coefficients, our quadratic zeros will always come in conjugate pairs, a plus or minus bi, but they won't show up as x-intercepts That means graphically we have no x-intercepts. So the plus or minus is the conjugate pairs part. This tells us by looking at all these as derivatives, it tells us all the different things that could be happening in our function. Notice that when we have distinct real zeros, we can see that at both of, if, that's, if this is the derivative of some cubic, that cubic has to have a local maximum and a local minimum. Because if we're gonna have distinct real zeros, there's gonna be a part where the parabola is, two parts where the parabola is above and one part below, so in between, or the in-between is above and outside parts are below. In both cases, the function is changing from increasing to decreasing, or from decreasing to increasing at each of those points. So in both of these cases, this gives us increasing, decreasing, increasing. So our function is increasing, decreasing, increasing, or decreasing, increasing, decreasing.
with only a cubic polynomial to work with, these are our options. Take a look at what's happening if we have repeated real zeros. Our function does flatten out at one point, but it never changes direction. So in these cases, the function goes flat, but does not change direction. F goes flat. Well, F prime equals zero, but does not change sign. So at that point, F, at each of those points, F prime is equal to zero, but the, the derivative does not change sign. It's positive, it's zero, then it's positive again. Or it's negative, it's zero, then it's negative again. It never changes sign. So that means F does not change direction. F goes flat. I spelled T wrong, or I spelled L wrong. I spelled it with a T. No, this is for repeated real zeros. F goes flat, but does not change direction. So the derivative is equal to zero, but does not change sign. So the function goes flat, but does not change direction. So we'll have a function that increases, goes flat, and then continues to increase. Or decreases, goes flat, and then continues to decrease. In the complex zeros case, the derivative is never equal to zero, so the function never even goes flat. In the complex zeros case, the derivative never equals zero, so the function never goes flat. It's just always increasing or always decreasing. So if you think back to polynomials and graphs of polynomials, you may have been told in the past that the number of turns that a polynomial graph makes is, is one less than the degree or is less than that by an even number. So a third degree polynomial can make two turns or zero turns. And now we see why. We get those two turns because we have distinct real zeros or zero turns because the function goes flat but does not change direction, or the function never even goes flat. If we have a fourth degree polynomial, that makes a maximum of three turns, but it could also be one turn, but can't be any less than that. That makes sense because a fourth degree polynomial has to take all the negative stuff and make it positive and all the positive stuff and make it positive. The ends go in the same direction. It must turn around somewhere. We can make three turns, or we can make one turn. We can go flat, but then keep going up again. Or we can go make a turn and then kind of chicane off to the right to slow the cars down. 
So that's where that comes from. It's one less than the degree because we're looking at how many zeros the derivative could have. Everybody have the number of terms in a polynomial graph? Is that part of your mathematical history? It's an uncommon part of mathematical history because it could be alluding to something later on, but then people just don't ever, don't even bring it up. You know what I mean? So I think the problem is that not enough people take calculus later on to make this connection. So they do the, the they, they, do, they don't game of thrones it. They don't like put the scene in there to refer to something that'll happen later on. It's like, oh, well, most people aren't gonna watch that last season. So let's not bother have Sam go and pick the sword off the wall because it's never gonna come up again. So why bother? So rather than have the scene where I'm like, oh, the number of turns a polynomial can graph is what make, make a polynomial graph to make is one less than the degree. We don't even bring that up because in calculus, most people aren't gonna come into the part where it's like, oh, Remember the number of turns thing? And people are like, oh, no, we didn't do that in pre-calc or algebra. And they're like, oh, dang it. That's when I have to call your teacher. So I call, come on, man, give me some help. I need some foreshadowing. Foreshadow calculus. Yeah, that's what I want. All right, that's going to do it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow and we will practice this optimization business. Bye, bye, bye. Have a good day.